Hi, Mom's Making Six Figures. Today, I get to interview my friend, Andrea Sorensen. She's the CEO of Lingo, which is a technology company. And I think you're going to take so many things away from this podcast. She is incredibly intelligent, and she gets incredibly vulnerable about some things in her life that probably quite a few of you will relate with. So enjoy this podcast and go check out her technology because you'll understand a little bit more of her story in it when you actually go look at it. I will see you in the podcast. Welcome to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast. My name is Heidi Bartolotta. I'm your host. In this podcast, you will hear real women, real stories, and real inspiration. If you enjoy it, please subscribe. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Yes. I'm excited. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I would love if you would start with how you came to be CEO. So start way back. (laughs) (laughs) Way back. Start with, yeah. Yeah. uh, I'm an accidental entrepreneur and launched uh, Lingo with a co-founder, two co-founders actually, um, about four years ago. And the reason why, my background is in process engineering, and I've just always been obsessed with how do you you remove the friction between a business and the people that they serve? And that's good for the business, and it's good for the people that they serve. And um, about four years ago, I I opened up my schedule. I had... had, um, resigned from a career that I absolutely loved because I wanted to spend a little more time with my son before he graduated from high school. And, um, and in, that, in that block of time with that additional space, I just became acutely aware of, of a solution that just felt like it had to exist. And I researched it, and I, I remember being surprised that it didn't already exist. It felt very obvious. And I, I felt almost offended that it hadn't uh, hadn't been created yet, and I felt compelled to build it. And so I partnered up with one of my clients who had a development firm, and we built an MVP, uh, which is a minimal viable product of Lingo, and tested it and had awesome response to that. And then I had a decision of, now what? I, I have this thing that I know uh, n- the world needs, and um, and I feel like I could, I feel like I could bring that, but that will require in many ways me facing fears. I never wanted to do that, never intended to do that, and it was a it was a really cool uh, moment of um, intentionally facing the things that I was afraid of, and being willing to give what I had to give to the world, and being willing to go through what I knew I would have to go through in order to be able to offer it. So that is how, that is the story of how did I become a a CEO and a founder of a a tech company. So take me back, because I think most people would say, how? How do you get there? Like, how how do you get to the place where you're like, okay, I know this needs to come out, and yes, I'm going to do it. it, Where did you start? Right. Um, I mean, if you go way, way back... (laughs) And I've been thinking about this because I've been listening and watching your podcasts. And by the way, the women that you've been able to interview are so inspiring. And it's been a powerful experience for me to hear their stories. And I've reflected back on my own um, in, in anticipation of, of um being asked that question and actually debated about whether I would share this or not. But if you go way back, then uh, then where this really starts, um, when I was really young, I had a, a very serious medical condition. I had a, a problems with my liver that, that resulted in my skin um, uh, 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 having sores all over. It looked like you had taken sandpaper and just scratched off all my skin. All my, my clothes would be bloody every day. My, my sheets every night would have to be washed. And from the age of about six to 
13 or 14, that's what I experienced. And what would happen is that the doctors would give me medicine that would um, help the skin but hurt the liver, and it just propelled the problem. And we didn't discover that until I was 13 or 14. And um, and once we did, of course, then the, the it was almost overnight. I don't have any scars. There's no sign of that happening. But that had such a significant impact for me in terms of how much effort you can put if you put your energy on the symptoms and not the core of the problem mm-hmm. and um, and how much pain you can go through and and wasted time and hurt. And uh, so I have always been obsessed with how do you find the core of a problem and then address that core of the problem. And and so my my career was was focused on process engineering, which mm-hmm. is exactly that, you know. It, it's how do you how do you achieve the better outcomes by having a more of a holistic view of the whole system, an understanding of the business, an understanding of the culture and the people in it, an understanding of the customers that you serve and how you provide value and you have to have all of that and my career was completely focused on being able to say here's the results that the business wants and that the customers need because it has to be good for both Mm -hmm. and then here's the levers and find the real places right so uh and i'm 47 i graduated when i was 16 and with all of the energy to try to make a difference in the world that's where i put my energy. And um, so my career was in project management and process engineering and and leadership and management and implementing changes and and analysis of problems. And so um, that that's kind of the the way that it winds up to a point that um, after a, a career of, of hundreds of different initiatives and changes in different in different companies that that I felt like I had a broad enough understanding to tackle a very large and complex problem with a simple solution and and maybe why I was a little more uniquely prepared mm-hmm. to be able to do that. I was gonna say, don't you kind of feel like everything prepared you for where you are right now? Yes. It's funny how you say that because um, it all felt very random. And it also felt like I was so different. The things that I did, I managed um, technical writing teams. I did a bunch of project management. I had PR positions. I had, you know, project management positions, the process engineering, all of those types. I taught at, at BSU and University of Phoenix communication and business courses. Like all of those things felt very unusual to put together. And yet all of those experiences and, and also combined in that was helping to lead, uh, uh, looking at a system within an organization also includes looking at the technology and the tools uh, as well. And so I had led, uh, I had led teams that had produced the the technology that a business uses to communicate with their um, audience. And so all of that kind of combines into a way that I, I do feel like it, it prepared me for what I didn't expect would would combine all of those things together. Now everyone's going to have to go look at lingo because <laughs> you'll have to understand how all of those all of that fits in together. together. <laughs> right, right. So motherhood in all of that, mm-hmm. you mentioned that you stepped back to spend those last few years. How how did that all work together for you? What did that look like for you? Yes. Um, so I have one child. His name is Isaac. And um, and I had, that's another thing. I, I, I think it's really fascinating just to realize we all have a picture of what we think our life is going to be and how it's going to work out, right? And I had expectations of myself and kind of a path that I thought my life would follow. And I come from a large family and and expected that what would happen is I would get married and I wanted to have a career for a while. And then I thought I would have like a bunch of children and focus on that for a while. And then, and, and we were only able to have, uh, we were only able to have one child and he's just, he's a very full personality. Uh, and, um, and, and so I was able to I had opportunities to be able to balance things differently than I anticipated I would be able to. And that was a that was a tricky thing for me to feel like I didn't have I didn't have what I wanted with the larger family. And I think that actually 
gave me even more motivation that I wanted my career to have an impact. I wanted the time uh, and I wanted the opportunities that I had to be able to contribute in significant ways. Um, and partially because, I mean, when we do have children, we know that that's our legacy. That's that's what goes on beyond us. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was going to look different for me than what I expected. And so I think part of what I really wanted was my career to also have an impact and to have a legacy as well. So this is pretty personal, but did you, what was that emotionally like realizing that, hey, I thought I was going to have definitely more than one. Mm -hmm. And when that feels like it's not something that's going to happen. Did it take a while for you to process that? Was that, did it happen gradually over time? Or was it one of those things where it's like, this isn't going to happen. And now I need to emotionally deal with this. What was that like for you? Because I think there's a lot of yeah. women that that hits them. And no one's ever said, hey, this is a possibility because we don't know until it happens, right? That That is a beautiful and very... Uh, insightful question and also something that uh, that I'm going to share with everyone right that I, that uh, is very very um, very tender and, and a turning point for me so what had happened is after we had Isaac um, uh, we lost several babies and then um, with the very last one uh, we were able to and we had, so we lost several babies and we had so many surgeries trying to be able to repair the damage so that we could carry, so that we could have more. And the last baby we were able to carry for about five months and then my uterus ruptured and it was the day after Christmas. And um, and what had happened um, is that uh, like I, I went into the, I went into like a dock in the box and, and um, the they, they couldn't find my pulse. They couldn't, you know, they ambulance to the hospital and, um, and, uh, and they, they had to, to take the, the baby and the, and, um, and I remember being in the hospital for several days after that with, um, trying to recover from, uh, from the, the, the physical of it. And I was able to hold like this beautiful five month little you know, a baby and see, you know, my husband's features and my features and, and know that that was my last chance, you know, and that we were, it was really a door that was shut. And there was a, a moment, um, one of the nurses brought in this box that had been hand painted by someone. And um, it was just, it was this beautiful box and it had a little, it was just like this little blanket thing you could fold the baby up in, right? The, and, um, and I remember thinking, I'll never know who made that box, right? And yet someone, someone spent so much time and effort towards me that they would never meet. And I still have that box. And it represents to me what, what I want my life to be. I want to be able to make an impact to people that I'll never meet that can really help them in the key moments of their life that they need something. So in that moment, I remember having this feeling that was like, Andrea, you have, this is a big deal, you know, and this is a big blow. And it, it, it shifted my identity, you know, what I thought I was going to, my life was going to be like, how I thought I was going to grow and, and everything was going to be different, right? And I felt in that moment... I felt like I had this validation that this is a, a hard enough, big enough deal that um, that if I wanted to be bitter and angry, I had a good enough reason to be. Mm -hmm. Like this was a, a big enough thing. But I also felt like this burst of clarity that says, but if you choose that, then you'll miss out on the joy of raising the son that you do have. And you'll miss out on the joy of what life can bring. And so it just felt like this distinct um, choice of, do you want to be sad about and angry about what you don't have, or do you want to find joy and opportunity in what you do? And that's what I have tried to choose. And 
And to be able to really love the experience of being able to raise Isaac. And it was a totally different experience than what I expected. Raising a single child is completely different than having a group of, I came from a, a family with six children. And, um, and, and my mom, we would wander out into the backyard and the neighborhood and we would be gone all day and then we would come in and she would feed us and love us and we would go to bed right with one child it was very much hey mom what are we going to do now you know i mean <laughs> so the level of right. interaction that i had with him was a huge blessing and and i love that experience which is so different than what i expected so i think that what you find is that in your struggle is also the opportunity for where your joy is, but it's your choice about how you look at it, how you metabolize it, and what you choose. If I had focused, and I mean, this is obvious from that, I mean, if I had focused on being, on, on what I had lost, then, then that, that would consume your soul, right? Mm -hmm. I think that same lesson happens with anger and forgiveness and with, you know, so many other types of things that, that, um, to be able to shift your attention towards building rather than looking back. There was a, there, there's a, a, something I think about a lot in terms of um, a, the burned down forest, right? So sometimes life with life, you get a burned down forest and, and you know what it looked like, you know what you had and you knew what the potential of it was and now it's all burned down. And what you want to do is just sit down on a burned down log and peek, pick up every piece of, you know, burnt anything, you know, and turn every rock and spend all of our time in, in counseling, which I do think counseling is great when it moves you forward. But if we just stay where we're at, analyzing the pieces of our burned down forest, then we'll stay there. And nature, when there's a burned down forest, nature just grows beautiful things. And I think that's what we're designed to do too is to say, well, crap, my I'm in a burned down forest, right? And I don't have what I, I don't have the opportunities that I thought I had. What opportunities do I have? And um, and try to put my attention there. That's a beautiful analogy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, Heidi, <laughs> like does that trigger any particular oh, thought yeah. or memory with you? Oh yeah. <laughs> um. <clears throat> I don't think I've said this on camera yet. I, um, I'm i divorced, which is not something I ever had anticipated. Mm -hmm. And it shifts. I, I mean, there's been a few things in my life that I could say that about, but that's the most recent. And it definitely changes your view of life, your identity, your do I want to <laughs> look at the negative and get bitter or... How is this? How is this life gonna be moving forward from here? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the choosing to look at the positive in life is a choice, mm -hmm. and but it's not always easy. It's taking control of our mind and actually controlling it and not letting it go the negative direction that I think is so easy to go sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. being intentional and actually designing what you want your life to be to say, okay, well, here's the ingredients I have now, mm -hmm. right? And I think um, early on when I was very young, so I was 22, I was also went through a, a divorce. And, um, and that was another turning point in my life where I got to decide who am I going to be? And I could look at some patterns that I had fallen into that, that uh, weren't what I wanted Mm -hmm. you know, and changes I could make. And, uh, and that'll be a, you know, for, and I think we have those for in a lot of different ways. It can be divorce, it can be a loss of a child, it can be, mm -hmm. you know, a career change or whatever it might be. It creates space in our life where we can intentionally, you know, look at it and say, what do I want to become? And what impact do I want to have? Mm -hmm. You know, I love that word intentional. Yeah. Yeah. The choice. Yeah big deal to manage the emotions and and I think it's important to acknowledge the emotions you know you have to you have to go I think about the waterfall right and you have to go down with the water but then you need to come up with the water and not fight against the emotions learn to let them flow and learn to be able to 
cry when you need to cry. And that, for me, that was a big deal. I had never allowed emotion like that. I had always tried to be so strong. And in that instance, when we lost um, the baby, like the emotions were, were too strong for me to hold back. And that's where I learned to start to let to let them move. And there's power in being in being able to feel your emotions and also in being able to not be afraid of other people's emotions. And I've learned to love the trust when someone will open up and show me what's really inside, mm -hmm. you know, and the real stuff to have the emotions flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That feeling piece is hard for some people, though. Yeah. That's why they fight it so much, right? Because... I think I think sometimes they feel like it's going to take them down and they're never going to come back up. <clears throat> and so it, they think that that fighting is going to save them from it. Right. Yeah. And that's why they get stuck there. Yeah. The fighting is like <laughs> the fighting will keep you there longer. Mm -hmm. But I mean it's never fun to go over the edge of a waterfall. Like I it's mm -hmm. no it's never fun to have to feel that intensity of emotion and and um, and emotions can be really scary. That it's been described, um, it's been described as that our logical mind is like the jockey of a horse, and and the uh, the emotion is the racehorse. And it's so nice when you keep it in control, right? Mm -hmm. But at the point that it gets out of control, like it can be very scary. And uh, and but our lives, like the, it only moves the way we want it when those things can be in harmony together. You know. Mm -hmm. I also think when when I think about emotion, and especially in something so significant as your experience, it doesn't come in a linear path. And I think a lot of times, and especially somebody that is so planned and organized, <laughs> you want it to be, okay, well, I feel this, and then I do this, and it will take you here, and then it'll take you back here, and then it takes you over here. Mm -hmm. And learning how to navigate that is, that's, that's an experience in and of itself. Oh, yeah. I think that's, if I were to, say what's the biggest skill that I find in the most successful people, it's the ability to be resilient. It's the ability to continue to say, okay, here's where I'm at, right? And to learn the lessons from the past, but then to have the wisdom and the awareness to say, here's where I'm at and here's where my choices are. Because I think we only have so much attention and we can put our attention looking back, right? Mm -hmm. Or we can assess where we're at and uh, and move forward. And and but if if you don't acknowledge the emotion, right, and process through it, then I think it sabotages sabotages you at at times you don't want it to, right? And yeah. you can't really control it. You have to be able to metabolize that. And I think that all of those emotions can become strengths. And I think they can really? especially become strengths with our ability to care about and empathize and help and nurture others. And, and in that way, all of those experiences are not wasted mm -hmm. when we can help someone else be able to navigate something that we may have some experience with. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think for those that are listening, if they're going through something really, really tough, I think for me, and I've watched this in so many women, the women that are able to feel it and be vulnerable on the other side of it help so many people because they're willing to talk about their experience and actually maybe help someone else process it, right? And um, I've watched, I have a, a very dear friend of mine that lost a child and mm -hmm. I've watched the pain and the anguish and the anger and all of the things but on the other side, she's helped so many people because she was willing to go through it and actually be vulnerable with people about it. And that's, it's sad, but that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So. I love what you said too, because I think that, um, I mean, these are things, what you shared, I, I don't know how many people know that. I've already shared three things that I don't, that most people don't know about me. And um, and I think that there's something significant in that, in that, in that everyone is going is going through something now. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a challenge now, and everyone has significant things in their past. 
and they're all different. Mm -hmm. um, but we can all learn the same type of things even through the differences of experiences and especially when we can combine those, you know, to help mm -hmm. uh, learn and, and lift each other. So I'm going to pull this back to mm -hmm. a question that I ask all of my guests, which is, is there a book or podcast that you recommend on a regular basis? Is there that one? Mm. So now it's this one for a podcast. I really <laughs> love this podcast. Thank you. Um, I think that it's amazing the level of authenticity that I've seen your guests be able to uh, feel safe enough mm -hmm. for. And um, that was a good model for me as well. <laughs> Um, and I love, recently I found another one called, um, it's Guy Kawasaki, and he it, he has some a podcast called Remarkable People, and that Ooh. one's really fun. Love Entrepreneurs on Fire. Mm -hmm. um, those are a few. In terms of books, uh, I read, I read a lot, and I circle back to many of the, the same books. Um, right now I'm reading a book called The Voltage Effect. I really love that as it starts to think about how do we scale whatever we're doing, how do we scale that so that we can have more impact. Love that uh, kind of concept, but obviously that's and my that's goal with what I'm right trying to do with my business. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I would say also uh, a, a core one, very simple, is the how to win friends and influence people. It's just basic, mm -hmm. basic concepts um, that help uh, to help to connect. Um, and I think what I what I would recommend actually is the the ability to learn from experts through books, whether it's reading or listening. I do most of mine through listening in the car is in incredible, you know? So as each of us try to say, well, where's our gaps and where am I struggling? Mm -hmm. And then go find someone who has developed that skill and has made that their career and their mission in life and then learn from them from whatever that book is. So true. Yeah, it'll be different for everyone. And your best mom tip. Mm. <laughs> So um, I think in a lot of ways, I am not, all, I'm also not the typical mom, right? Um, probably Isaac, Isaac wouldn't have uh, survived his childhood if I had had to feed him, uh, clothe him, keep him warm. <laughs> but but I, I did listen and I asked a lot of questions and, and the focus, I think if we really really look, uh, stop everything that we're doing in those moments that they're ready to talk to us, right? And for him, it was like right before he went to bed, he, um, and that was hard because I would be tired. You know that I'm a morning person yeah. and the evenings I wanted to go to bed so bad. But if you find those moments where they want to open up and they want to talk, then stop everything and be there, put your whole attention on it because um, my son is 20 now, right? And I found myself saying the thing that everyone says, but I couldn't stop myself from saying it because it, it's so true, it goes so fast. Mm -hmm. And and I think the thing I wanted was to figure out how to slow it down and how to really get the most out of it because I only had one. And um, you can't slow it down and it's still gonna go fast no matter what, but, but take the time that we have, you know, with the interaction to have the conversations and to listen. And and that's cool because then you have the relationship, you know, that that like will as as he grows up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be my my mom tip. So what didn't I ask you? Is there anything that I didn't ask? I would like to know. I would like to know your mom tip. Oh, oh my goodness. Um, you would throw that one at me. <laughs> um, for me, right now, I have two teenagers. As you know, one's about to leave for college, and the other one is, I have three years left, and 
I would say savor a, a little bit along the lines of what you said, mm -hmm. savor the moments and just let the things roll off that aren't important. I think sometimes as moms, we want so badly to help to guide them or to point them in the right direction. And sometimes you have to just like let it be and just enjoy who they are, where they are. I read a quote years ago that I write a lot, especially with one of my children, which is don't make your children color into the lines of your life. Ooh. And, um, you know, that's a challenging one sometimes to just let them be who they are and really just absorb that and love on them in that. Yeah. I have another question for you, too. Mm -hmm. um, so through these interviews that you've done, mm -hmm. these amazing women, right? And I'm so excited to be here. I'm like, I, this You're feels so, so good. I feel imposter syndrome big time. I'm like, sweet, I tricked them, I'm here. <laughs> but um, what, what have you found to be like a common thread across, across the women that have been in this chair mm -hmm. that, that your listeners may or may not have picked up on that you have. We all fall. And it's so interesting to me to listen to women that are willing, like you, to be vulnerable about their journey and that we all have struggles. And I think one of my goals with this podcast was that women would hear other women struggle because I always hear women say, oh, well, that was easy for you. Or they look at someone like you that's had tremendous success and they just think, oh, well, mm -hmm. you're gifted in that way. Well, <clears throat> no, there's a lot that goes in behind that. And I just, in every single one of them, that's the case. The stumbles are different. The trials are different. Their fear is different sometimes. Um, but we all have it. And I think if you were to listen to all of them back to back, you really hear that come out in different ways. But we're all just human, and we have our strengths and our weaknesses, and we all stumble, right? So I love that. I, it's funny, as I was listening and watching some of the podcasts, I was like, oh, no. Like, that's what I would have said, and now I don't have anything, <laughs> like, unique to offer. But I would agree it's very much a common theme that one of the key parts of being successful, and I, I don't know if I circled back to this point or not, but the, the key thing that I've seen with people that are successful is that ability to be able to be resilient and to get back up and mm -hmm. to be willing to be brave enough to stay in their, in, to stay in their learning zone, right? To yeah. do brave things that they don't do well, that they don't know how to do yet, mm -hmm. right? And you will fall and you will mess up. Um, and you want to retreat to your comfort zone and you and and it has to be like an override to to go back out and be brave and try again and do something, you know, that that is risky. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's a that be that's brave a huge, part is a it's a huge choice. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm really excited to share this one. Thank you.